Hello, I'm Bradley Alisad. Today we're going to talk about GitHub and I'm going to give an introduction to GitHub and talk about some of the functionality you would find in a typical GitHub repository and how to work with those repositories and so that you can move forward and make some, start making some contributions. So let me share my screen. Okay, so this is our document here and I'll put this in the description uh, underneath the recording. Um, so first of all, what is Git? Let's take a step back and consider when we say GitHub, what we mean. Hub part is easy. It's a place where you can share your work and share your coding uh, activities. But what does Git mean? So Git is a, a version control me methodology. And this is the Wikipedia page here, or a stub from it. And it was uh, developed by um, Linus Torvalds in 2005, so uh, the same person who developed uh, a lot of the Linux stuff. Uh, he also was involved in creating Git. So uh, Git is a type of version control system. And so GitHub uses Git. Um, there's GitLab, which is another type of uh, platform that uses Git. Also things like Bitbucket also use a Git um, mechanism. And so this is something that was uh, kind of part and parcel of the Linux kernel developing it and trying to develop a way to share files and keep everything straight. Um, before Git, you know, there were different version control systems um, that existed, uh, but Git was the first uh, version control system to really be seamless. And it obviously was successful because it's been integrated into a lot of platforms. So other places you might use Git, uh, Bitbucket, which is a GitHub competitor, it's run by Atlassian, uh, GitLab, which is a more for uh, development operations, but still you know, uses a similar layout to GitHub where you have version control functionality and the social aspect. And then Gitbook, which is oriented towards creating docs like books and documentation. So what's in a name? And I, I, I bring this up because, you know, people say, well, what does Git mean? How did it, why did they call it Git? And so uh, this is a interesting aside and naming conventions, but uh, Torvalds sarcastically quipped about the name Git, which means unpleasant person in British English slang. I'm an egotistical bastard and I name all my projects after myself. First Linux, now Git. So that was the origin, it's kind of maybe a joke. The main page describes Git as the stupid content tracker. Uh, the readme file the source code elaborates further, and it turns out that Git can mean anything depending on your mood. It's a random three-letter combination that is pronounceable and not used by any Unix command. Um, Git may be, you know, to fetch something. Uh, it can mean stupid in, in slang. Um, it, it can mean global information tracker, so it can be an acronym for that. Um, and then uh, some other thing when it breaks, you don't want to. So yeah, it has a lot of meanings that we, you know, kind of converge upon. This is just naming conventions, and this is the way things get named in software development and other things like gene names, for example, uh, can be quite, um, you know, surprising as to what people have named them. So these are things that it's just a convention. So I just wanted to go over that just so people knew where that origin was and, and what Git is and how it's sort of proliferated um, in the open source space. Now, there were versions of um, version control before Git, uh, one of them being Subversion. Uh, this is something that you could download and use. Uh, there were other, like there was a platform called Groove, which I remember using back in the aughts, uh, which was where you would and you can still do this in GitHub, but it's it's less common where you check documents out and then you have to check them back in. People can't use the document when it's checked out, so you have to check it back in. And it's, you know, it, it's not as seamless as Git where you can compare things in real time. You can find the diffs of files. You can, um, you know, nothing really gets overwritten because you always have a record of things and you always have uh, the ability to integrate materials at will. You can review things line item by line item and uh, incorporate them that way. So it's 
the earlier versions of Git were not, or the earlier versions of version control were not as seamless as Git. So well, there are a couple of things I want to go over with GitHub. I want to go over some kind of step-by-step -step things. So the first thing is to do a pull request. So say if you want to do a pull request, you have to do a couple of things in order to do this pull request. And I use this terminology because I want to review this because this is jargon and I want to go over what it actually means. So the first thing you need to do when you do a pull request is you need to fork a repository. And so your fork is here. You see this tab that says fork. If you go to a main repository, say this is Rockwire, Rockwire community will be working with this. If you want to make a pull request, the first thing you should do is fork a repository. And I'm using best practices here. So some people will create a, a, a branch on the main repository and you can issue a pull request that way. But uh, for the sake of this tutorial, we're gonna make a fork. So you go ahead and you fork that repository. I'm not going to walk through this step by step. I'm just going to show you kind of the steps in the interface. So this is the um, the GUI for uh, GitHub, and you could do use uh, you can use command line statements, but we're not going to go through that in this tutorial. So you would fork this repository, and it would create a version of this repository copied to your home or your home uh, account. So if your identity is your last name, it would be your last name slash community wiki slash readme. This would all be kind of cloned in your own repository. So that's the first step. Then once you fork your repository, you work from that fork. And it's a parallel version of the repository. So you, once you make a fork, things will you know, your repository, your forked repository will exist. The original repository will exist. And then when you want to make a change and submit it, that submission then will update this, the home repository, but your fork may become out of date. So oftentimes you have to synchronize your fork with the main repository. And, and that's something that you can do um, if you, once you have a fork, there's a button that says synchronize fork or refresh fork. And that, that will fetch things from upstream or downstream and it will bring things into sync. And so you want to do that if you're doing a long-term contribution, you want to be able to sync those forks. Uh, but you want to make changes to, the, to your fork and then submit them to the main repository. So this is something you can do. Um, you're going to be go to this pull request tab. There are no pull, open pull requests here. If you make a new pull request, um, you get an interface here where you have to compare a base. Uh, you have a base and then you have the comparison. So you wanna compare it to, I think this will be the home repository. This will be your fork. So your fork is writing to the base and then you'll compare those two you'll click on create a pull request, and then you'll go through this form where it asks you specific questions about what you're actually submitting. And that's where you'll fill in all the details about your contribution. And then you'll say, issue pull request. And then in the home uh, repository, there will be a pull request that will have a one next to it. And you'll have a pull request that needs to be accepted by the home organization. They'll review it. They may send back comments and say we need more information or they'll accept it and then you'll have a contribution. So uh, what, is a, what is in a repository? Maybe we should back up. I've, I've gone through pull requests, but what's actually in a repository uh, that you fork? And what are, what are the kinds of things we find in common in repositories? So the first thing we have here is, um, we have, uh, you know, if you're creating a new repository or if you're forking one, you notice that there are a couple of templates that we have. We have the README template, we have the license template, we have the contributors template, and then we have a code of conduct. So if we go to this repository, this one has all of those. So the README here is actually 
I was uh, actually, this is an example of a README where you have a welcome statement, you have some images, some links, you have some materials here to get people engaged and in, in, in oriented into the community. Um, so that's one way you can use a README. Um, we have a template, a README template for our organization where we have like, you know, for coding uh, uh, repositories, we'll have different things in the repository that are, you know, version control, uh, you know, we'll have notes on different versions of things. We'll have a description, we'll have information on how to install something and all of that. So I think this is an example of our template here. So this is the Rockwire README template. This is where you, this is just kind of like a guide for if you're creating a template, you have a document title, you have maybe some authorship, a table for authors. This is all written in Markdown. So these are things that can be edited easily uh, by any contributor. Um, you fill out that information, you list your dependencies and you're getting started. You tell people how to get started with your repository. Since anyone can make a copy of it, you need to tell them maybe how to run it on their own machine or what they need to do to contribute. There are all sorts of things you can put in here. Uh, but you know, the more information you can give, the better. Then there's a version history, which is what I was referring to before. This is where you have different versions. If you're versioning your a repository or your software, if you're not, you might put in information about different major changes that have happened, different um, pull requests or, or, or things that have, you know, transpired in the history of the repo. This can be updated by the maintainer of the repo. So this is something that you know, maybe even a, a person who works the repo could add to this if they were uh, involved in that in that decision. So this is uh, version history. It's very important to keep this annotated because it tells people a lot about what's happened historically and then what they might do in the future. The licensing and attribution is important because we want to know under what license and what conditions we're contributing under. And then acknowledgments, which is further reading. So that's the, uh, the README. Then there's a uh, license, which is also very important. Um, this one does not have a license actually. Um, this one has, this one has a license. Well, the license is usually something that is a, sort of a, uh, you know, there's a template for a license in GitHub. License is usually something that's a copyleft license or an open GPL license. And there's usually, for some reason, this one doesn't have it in there, but you can have a license that it just states the license and the terms. And there's a link to it and they have like nice templates in GitHub for this. And then of course there is the contributors. So the contributors is um, this one. This tells you something about contributing to the platform. So these might have your guidelines for how to contribute more specifically. So this tells you like, you know, the conditions under how you can contribute, the different ways you can contribute. And then the code of conduct is listed here. So this is usually, a, a, you know, a set of, a, a set of a social contract to discuss how people should conduct themselves in the community. And then, uh, so, here are examples of each of these. Uh, we have some templates here. Um, and so all of those should be in a repository. Um, if you're forking it, they should already be there. But if you're, fork, if you're using your fork, say, as a way to, to create a new project, you should also make sure that you update those documents uh, to reflect what you're doing. Uh, so then there are these styles of maintenance. And I get into these really quickly. There's more to read on this if you want to read more. Uh, but there are three different ways you can maintain your repository. Maintenance is very important. It often gets neglected in smaller projects because there's just not enough, you know, uh, labor. There aren't people who are around for a long enough period of time to really be strong maintainers. But a maintainer is someone who keeps up with the code, uh, you know, makes sure that the pull requests are you know, consistent with what's going on, maybe with the standards of development or whatever. So it's not an easy job. Uh, oftentimes you don't really have a, a maintainer. Sometimes some repositories are maintainer. Sometimes we call the maintainer a code owner, but sometimes we have maintainers 
who, uh, whose job it is to just kind of go through and maintain the repositories, the audits and things like that. Um, but there are three kinds of maintenance. The first kind of maintenance is what we call trunk-based versus fork-based development. So I told you about creating a fork if you want to make a pull request. That's not entirely always true. Um, that's what we call fork-based development. That's a certain style of development. This is where if you want to make a contribution, you create a fork, you make changes on your fork, and then you push it back to the main repository. And the benefit of that is you can do more with more different files. So you don't have to, uh, you know, go from file to file and make changes. You can have the entire project, a copy of it, and then change multiple files and maybe, you know, uh, download to your local machine, make it what they call a clone to your local machine, uh, test it out. You can make different changes to different files and not have to worry about making a, a, a commit back to the main uh, copy right away. You can, you know, develop it gradually. You can have permissions on, say, one, uh, one organization versus another organization's account. So it makes things easier that way. Um, Fork-based development is one strategy, though. The other strategy being trunk-based development. And this is where you work from the trunk of the tree. You don't make any forks. You just work from that trunk. And so when I say trunk, I mean from the main organization. So in this case, it would be the Rockwood organization. And what you would do is you would make branches. So you would create a branch, and that branch then would be a copy of a file that, so this one is master, this doesn't have any branches, but you can create a branch. And that branch would be something that you would modify. And it wouldn't be part of this master branch because that master branch hasn't been changed yet. You would create a, uh, a branch, make changes to that branch, and then commit as that branch. So say we had branch A and branch B and then master. A and B could be different things. They have different changes. And then we take A or B or both and commit them to master later. So then you would issue a pull request to commit that to master. And then once it's in master, then you know you commit it, you compare, you make a uh, comparison of the changes in something they call a diff, which is uh, where you compare it line by line and uh, character by character and show the differences. And then you make a commit and then that change is incorporated. But your development is on the branch, it's not on the fork. So you don't need to have a separate clone of the repository. The branches work in the same way a fork does, everything's in parallel. So A and B would coexist with master. You could switch between master A or B to see what those versions look like. But at the end of the day, you can still commit to that master branch instead of the home source repository. So it's just a different way of developing. There are pros and cons to each, and you can read up more on it later. Then there's something we call Git forking versus Git branching model with contributions, and I think I've talked about that. This is just, again, this is based on these two different uh, types of development, but this is encouraging people to contribute in one way versus another way. And, you know, in some communities, you might have a mix of both of these. So you might have branching and forking. So maybe you're, uh, you know, a specific development team might do a branch, get branching model of development where they create branches on a, on, a, on a repository. And, you know, that's good if you're doing like a lot of internal development in your own group. Uh, if you're, you have a class or if you have an internal development team, you might do things with the branches and you might commit by a branch and you don't really fork anything. Uh, I, by, by contrast, if you have a you know if you have a project and then you have a sub project, you might be well suited to forking that um, project, forking that original repository, and then of course you can branch you can have a branching strategy within that fork. Um, there's a very strong tree metaphor here, and if you think about trees, they have you know you have a you have a trunk, you have branches, those branches are branches, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, you get down to the twigs at the tip of the tree, and they can be very fine grained. So, a lot of these things, you know, they could be high. You have a sort of a, you can have a hybrid. 
you can uh, uh, encourage people to fork things, you can encourage people to branch things, but they're all sort of just strategies. It depends on what you're doing. And finally, there's this uh, idea of code review. And code review is something that we go over, um, you know, not infrequently. You want to have good code at the end of the day. You don't want to commit something or a pull request that's not good. And so you have to go back and forth with the person making, approving the commit to make all these changes. Uh, sometimes that's inevitable. Um, other times you can, you can prevent that by doing a number of things of code review. And so there are different strategies of code review. Uh, one of them is asynchronous, which is where you have, you know, you, you write a piece of code and then you have someone else check it. Perhaps, you know, you do this with your internal group. You uh, make a branch, you make changes to the code or you write some code, you commit it back or you, you, you know, allow someone else to look at your branch before you make the commit. And then you commit it back to the main copy. Uh, this allows you to kind of get a pre-review uh, approval from someone else, you know, from a fresh set of eyes, and it helps you to avoid error, simple errors. So you don't want to introduce errors in the code base. This is a way to prevent that or minimize that. Then there's synchronous code review, which um, one way of doing that is sort of paired programming, where two people set up the computer, one person types, one person checks. Uh, you know, there are other ways to do that. You can do that in a virtual meeting. You're sharing your screen and you're writing code and the other person might say, oh, you have an error on line 140 or something. Um, then there's meeting-based review. So this is where you might have an hour-long meeting once a week and you go through the code contributions. You bring them up in a screen share and then the group will uh, point out the errors. And this is another way just to bring fresh sets of eyes to the code and fresh sets of eyes to the problem to minimize any errors. And the, the good thing about this is, is that you can do this before you make committed changes. So you can keep a copy, a rough draft, if you will, and make, you know, refine that before you make it uh, the final answer. So that's, that's always good. So the next thing I want to talk about is creating an issue. So I've created an issue here, and this is for uh, Chris uh, Nahuibe, who's been helping me with uh, developing this, these course materials. Uh, this was an issue I created for him just to show how issues work. So what you do is you go to this issues tab in GitHub and it allows, you know, you can see all the issues here. There are all these different issues and you, if you want to create an issue, you go to this, tab, this button, new issue. And then a lot of repositories will have these templates that allow you to sort of, um, you know, uh, work from a template. So this template has a number of questions. This is for if someone wants to create new wiki content. So this is an event we have in this community uh, or modify existing content. They fill out this form and they can submit it. And this makes it easy, easier for the person, the maintainer who's addressing the issue to, to get the answer that they need from the contributor. Uh, you can also open a blank issue, which is just where there's no template and no questions. You just give your yeah, uh, issue, you state your issue. And then when you're done, you submit a new issue, hit the screen button. And then this issue exists in, it's assigned a number and it exists in this issues tab, which then has, you know, you can follow up on some of these things with comments. So you can leave comments, you can comment, you can close the issue later. There are all sorts of things you can do to manage issues. Uh, one of those things is to have an issue board. So this is an issue board, and this is a way to keep track of issues. So each of these issues have a number. And so each of these little cards are an issue, has a number, and it has a place in this board. I've created this board with a couple of different categories. And this is just, this is a Kanban board where we have categories. We say, there are things to do, there are things we want to hold, there are things that are in progress and so forth. And we go through this and we can make, uh, you know, we can keep monitor these, these issues and their status. So this one, for example, is in progress. This is a hold repeating one. I put that in there because I wanted to go back to it. There are different ways you can set this board up. You bring the issues in and then you review this board periodically. So another thing you might do in your weekly meetings is you might review the board. 
uh, go to people who are tagged in these issues. You can tag individuals. You can also tag them with uh, topical tags. So this one says help wanted. So this is a way to let people know what it is and, and what's needed. Uh, this is an education issue. This is a good first issue. So this is something that people, when they come into the community, this is something maybe they should try first. So there are different ways you can communicate to new people, to existing contributors, what you need with these issues, what needs to be achieved. Um, breaking things down into issues is a different topic, and I can talk about that in another session. But for now, let's just say that this is a, a pretty good way to manage issues. And um, so you, you know, you have you create an issue, then you put it on the board, and then you walk through and you, you follow up on it. And it's it's a pretty simple process. Um, so now, you know, you can, uh, you have a project board and create issues of your own, depending on what you want or your needs. Um, you can tag other people in them. Uh, so then why don't we take a file and look at its history? So this is a file that I have. This is our readme template. And say, I want to know what the history of this file is. Maybe I made a change and I didn't want to make the change after all. And I committed it and now I'm stuck with it. Actually, I'm not stuck with it. What I can do is I can look at the history of the file. So you go to this history bar and you see that the current version of this file that I just showed you is here, the top. This is where it's kind of like, this is the last time it was committed. Uh, but then there, there, there's a history here and there, there are versions that were committed before. So if you make a mistake and you make a commit, and then you think about it, and you're like, you know, maybe that's not what we wanted. You can actually go back to a previous version of this. And you have to go back and you have to display the, you know, you have to view the file like this. It's, you know, sometimes it doesn't, but you can see an older version of this. And then if you want to make a change, you can go back to the raw code. You can copy the code and paste it into the new version and make a commit. And you can recover that information that you have. So this is uh, the essence of version control, right? You have this new, ver you have this version, you can forward update it. It's all neat and clean, nothing gets overwritten. But if you do have an error or you wanna go back in history to look and see what the history of this file was, you can do that as well. You can go backwards and you can look at its history. You can pick any commit that was made and look at what that, state looked like. So it's a very nice system for looking forward and looking backward. You can go forward by making changes that aren't overwritten, that have their own unique identity, and then you'll have this backwards compatibility where you can look at the history. Um, so we looked at the commit history, and we can also look at the diffs. So we looked at the commit history, but one of the things that we can do as well is we can look at the diffs in this file. And so this is something that I can find it right off. Um, you can basically look at the way this is structured. So I'm on the wrong branch here. So I'm on a sub branch, okay. So I can actually look at the rendered blob of this. I can look at source blob. So this is what the source blob looks like. And then I can look at the diffs. And the diffs just show you, uh, like if you have two files, if you're, especially if you're making a pull request, it'll show you like the difference between the file that you've committed and the file that you're going to commit. So, you know, you have like something you want to commit. There's like a change here where it says contributor list contact info and other information. Let's just suppose that in this version, I have contributor list and I added this section in the new version. This one would be the difference between the committed file and the file I want to commit. So it would show up as a diff. And that diff means that I can look at the uh, pull request line by line and I can assess what was changed. And I can assess, even if I go backwards, I can assess what was changed from the previous version. So it's a very nice tool. And I, I'm not able to put my finger on it right now, but basically it shows you the diff. So let me see. Um, okay, I'm not going to do that. So, but that's that's the idea of a diff. And here's a here's an example of a diff. 
So you can see that it's changed one file here. This, this syntax was changed and that's the difference between these two files. So you can see the difference here between this version that is back in history and the version that exists now, there's a difference here of like on one line of like a, a tag. So you can see that. Uh, we also have wikis. So we have a wiki in our repository. Uh, if you go to this tab wikis, you see that we have our community wiki, you have this main page, and then you have these side pages, they call them stubs, and they just contain content that you can uh, click through. That was a sub part of that one. But this is the community events uh, stub, and you have this, uh, it's just you know events that people wanna know about or, or terminology or whatever, and you have all these different stubs that you can organize and categorize things. So whenever anything happens in your community, you can go back and you can create a stub and now people, everyone knows it's like a reference guide. But you can also, we also have a way to modify the wiki. Uh, the GitHub wiki isn't really good at like having multiple users using the actual interface and we want some quality control. So we use a system where you can actually create a pull request to request a new stub be made or a stub be changed. So you can go back and you can make a change to this, um, to the wiki, we have a catalog of pages. You go to the stub, you might want to make a change to this. Then you go back out and you make a pull request that defines that change. And I showed you, of course, that there are issues here. You can also create a new issue here where you propose the change. And then when you make the change, you can issue a pull request to have it accepted. I would suggest you know setting it up where you make an issue first and then the pull request so that you can screen these things at multiple levels so that there's a, you know, some continuity, you know kind of what to expect. And you can link issues in, in pull requests. So in a pull request, you often reference an issue number. The issue number tells the person uh, approving the pull request what they're doing or gives them some reference. Uh, you can also build resources in Markdown. I'm not going to go through a Markdown tutorial, but you can use Markdown to build all, you know, wikis, but also text files, README files in GitHub and use GitHub flavored Markdown. So if you want to know more about that, there's another tutorial. The other social features to this, uh, there, there are stars, pings, and watches. So you have uh, in a repository, you have these stars, which are here. Uh, so this allows you to star a repository. You can pin a repository, which gives you like updates on it, you know, uh, things and notifications. And then you also have a watch, which you can watch the uh, progress on the repository being made. So there are different social uh, social networking features on this that are really nice. And a lot of people don't take advantage of that part of GitHub. Uh, there are also Rockware ins or insights uh, for a repository. So this is the insights for Rockware. Uh, this tells you, you know, gives you some statistics about what's going on in your repositories. It tells you the number of pull requests, the number of pull requests merged. It gives you information about issues over a certain interval of time, and then where the members are getting work done. So most of the work in this repository is through commits and pull requests, some code review and some issues. And, this is a breakdown of what's going on in the repository. It's a nice in, uh, analytics tool to use. There's also um, uh, dependency graphs and other types of things. So there's GitHub Pulse. So this is on this repository, this Illinois app repository. Uh, this has a lot of the, uh, this is like a summary for like a week and you, can, you could have a summary for like a month or for 24 hours. And it gives you information about some of the pull requests being made and uh, some of the issues being addressed. And, you know, so it gives you these, sort of gives you the pulse of the community and it allows you to evaluate things. And there are other things in the pulse too. Uh, there's like a code frequency graph, which is where you see how, you know, how many additions and deletions are made per week. There's a dependency graph, there's a network, which tells you something about like, the number, the, you know, the, the interchange between forks and, and branches over time. And it's not coming up now, but it's a, it's a graph that, yeah, okay, here it is. So this shows you over a period of time, 
These are two different forks. This is the Rockwire repository. This is the Kara CW fork. This is going to be merged at some point. So there will be a line going back to the trunk. And there are all these branches that are going back to the trunk. So there are different ways you can visualize all this different information. Finally, if you're a student, or even if you're not a student, GitHub is really good resources for helping students navigate GitHub and using virtual uh, tools. So there's uh, how to run virtual events, uh, developing a tech stack for that. And there's a uh, tutorial on their blog. There's also a GitHub community. So this is uh, good features on GitHub. This has good features on GitHub functionality. And this is another uh, part of their blog where they, they have a community section of their blog that you can look up. Uh, you can reference things. And in addition, GitHub has a lot of nice tutorials for different things. So there's a lot of jargon that GitHub uses, but there's a very nice um, glossary for this purpose. And, and they do a very good job of updating it. Uh, but they also have this blog where they deal with different issues. So thank you for joining me uh, today. And I hope to see you again for some of our other uh, open source curriculum features. Thank you.